All right, welcome everyone to the next video in the exploitation series. In this video, we're going to look at how to generate shellcode, talk a little bit about what shellcode is, and probably more importantly, introduce a program that I use that I've created, a very simple program that allows you to, to test and even debug your shellcode for two very common things when dealing with shellcode. Uh, before we get started, if you aren't aware, this is a, you know one of several videos in a series talking about basics of exploitation. So I've added a link here to the playlist. Uh, consider checking out the rest of the videos if this is an, an, a topic that you're interested in. Um, also, if you haven't, please click subscribe. Um, subscribers help me to understand how the channel's growing and who's interested in it and to even pick topics. Uh, comments are always open, so please feel free to leave questions about the video, comments, constructive criticism things you'd like to see, things you don't quite understand, or maybe I didn't explain very well. So uh, hit subscribe and I, I much appreciate it. So um, for this video, then we're going to look at generating shellcode. Shellcode's a, a very interesting topic, but you know, it's a, it's a, it's a whole series in and of itself. So we're going to really just do, you know, approach this in the most practical way that I can. In doing so, we're going to use Kali Linux and take a look at the MSF Venom tool. Or, or framework, I guess. So it's available here as part of the Kali Linux distribution. Even MSF Venom is probably something that could span, you know, a good couple of videos of discussion. So we're just going to scratch the surface, and I'm going to talk in just enough to get some shellcode generated. Now, there are a number of different arguments here that you're going to see in order to generate the payload that we're going to analyze. And what we're going to do by the end of this video is take the shellcode that we've generated with MSF Venom, I'm going to provide a file here. We're using the dash O argument, so sc.bin or shellcode.bin. Um, we're going to look at this custom program so that we can test it. I like to test the shellcode before I try to you know, inject it into some vulnerable program so that I know it works. I don't want to have to try to troubleshoot the shellcode during the process of injecting it into, into memory or, or you know, exploiting a program because there could be something with how that exploitation is occurring that's messing up the shellcode. So it's, it's good to know that we're starting with functional shellcode. Now, the shellcode that we're going to generate, there's a dash P argument that allows us to define the payload type. So we're going to use Windows exec, which is literally the Windows exec function to execute some arbitrary Windows command. And in this case, that command is going to be calc, calc.exe. We're going to pop calc. Not the most creative, but I can tell you that it is still very rewarding when you're exploiting a program, no matter how simple it may be, and you see the calculator pop because you know then that your exploitation was correct and your shell code was executed. It's also very visible. It's easy to see. It's not like we're trying to set up a reverse shell or something, in which case then we have to monitor network traffic, maybe even have a listener set up somewhere else in order to establish the connection to see it work. Um, so there are many other payload types and you can get usage information, help information about MSF Venom, internet is full of great tutorials and resources and I would encourage you to take a look at it if you've never worked with MSF Venom before and just seeing what other payloads are available. Now the exit function this is another concept around shellcode that is fairly unique to it at least, at least in terms of of you know we have to consider how we're and where we're injecting our shellcode in and then what happens when the shellcode's done if the process crashes or if, it, or if it causes the process to crash, well, that can cause issues. Then let's say we have a reverse shell, but after the end of the shell code, once that reverse shell is established, how do we want to transfer control back to the process? Do we want it to continue to run? So there's a lot to consider there. In this case, I'm okay saying that the exit function should just terminate the process, in which case then our, our shell code will have ran and then our target process will just exit quietly. That's okay in this case, but it is definitely something to consider based off of the type of target that you're actually going after. Um, the output type, so not only are we going to write to shellcode.bin, but we're going to define the file type. What it's doing then is it's generating the shellcode in a way that's friendly to that particular language or format that you select here. And I'll provide a little bit better insight here when we look at the sample program. Okay, the last thing to consider is, and I'm going to execute this command while I talk about this, is the bad characters, right? We're injecting code into memory onto the stack via a stir copy. And so we know at a minimum that a bad character would be a null byte. If we have a null byte in the middle of our shell code, then as that stir copy is copying that onto the stack, once it hits the null byte, it's going to stop copy. And if that happens to be in the middle of our shell code, well, then our shell code's not going to work. So we want to avoid that character. Um, there are some arguments here or some assumptions that 
the MSF Venom makes, the platform, it wasn't selected. So it shows Windows, that's great because we have a target binary for the Windows environment, which means our shellcode needs to be able to run on Windows. This is 32-bit shellcode, that's fine. Right, we have a 32-bit program, so that means our process will be 32-bit, so we, we, I don't think we can inject 64-bit code anyway. Um, there's also a number of encoders, and encoders help to do many things, uh, one of which is to ensure that there are no null bytes, because you'll find that when you write shell code, avoiding certain characters, certain byte values, such as a null byte, can actually be kind of tricky. And so it has a number of built-in encoders to help deal with that. The Shikita Ganai is one of the most popular, so it's, it's pretty common to see. Um, and you'll see in this case that it did successfully choose that encoder, and then it created our payload with a size of 216 bytes, and then saved it. So. Um, this is helpful. We'll just use this to understand a little bit more about when we're testing the shell code that we're, you know, we're seeing it copied into memory correctly. And we really do, of course, need to understand the, what, we're, what we're injecting this into. Do we have enough space in memory to inject 216 bytes? In our case, no, right? because the programs that I've been using up until this point I've used very small buffers in order just to make them easier to talk about. So when we get back to our vulnerable program, we're gonna make the buffer a little bit larger to support the shell code. A little bit arbitrary, but I think it helps to convey the concept. So certainly in a real world scenario, um, you'd have to be cognizant of how much space you have available, what is the size of your payload, and are there gonna be problems there? And if so, you're gonna to have to find ways to resolve that. Okay, well, we've got our shell code sc.bin. This is just a raw shellcode file. I'm going to grab that. We'll move over to our Windows VM, continue our discussion.